Given the encroaching fuzziness encountered by a mind assailed with thought and emotion, originating not in sound reaction or meditation, but in a haze of listless apathy and panic interwoven, one's faculties are both stretched to capacity and left to sit in idleness. This presents an apparent contradiction that can, at face value, be understood only by experience. Perhaps a metaphor is of use in clarifying the full meaning. Suppose that a duck is given the onerous task of dragging a ball and chain everywhere it wanders. The duck will know the strengthening of its legs, given adequate sustenance. It will know fatigue and refreshment. However, it will never leave the ground in flight. Swimming, too, is excluded from its array of achievable activities. Thus, the bird is simultaneously overworked and underdeveloped. Its existence has been shifted to a routine that requires devotion to tasks to which the duck has only tertiary ability. The primary and even secondary abilities of the duck are not utilized at all in this existence. Substitute a mind for the unfortunate bird. Replace the ball and chain about its foot with a combination platter called the modern cares. This platter contains items to which the mind must devote attention. It also contains items of optional consideration. These may be respectively referred to as necessities and hobbies. In an ideal environment, the pursuit of necessities involves activation of the mind's strongest assets. This may involve anything from processing arithmetic to coordinating musculature. All depends on the breadwinning occupation. Once the necessities are either met or have mental resources allocated for them to be met, the hobbies may be attended. Again, an ideal environment would present hobbies that activate secondary or peripheral attributes of the mind, allowing a reprieve for the stronger faculties. Unideal environments may exist in variations. Consider the inverse case from the ideal, an environment where the mind's strongest attributes are passed over in the pursuit of necessity for its secondary, weaker attributes. The search for reprieve activates the primary strengths when engaging in hobbies and elicits wholesale coordination of the mind to the attainment of said goals. This coordination becomes disrupted, however, by two things. First, the inadequacy of the secondary strengths to complete acquisition of necessities by themselves. Second, the change in focus brought about by reallocating primary strengths not suited to the task toward the necessary functions. When its legs grow fatigued, the duck must drag itself forward by its wings or even its beak. The effects of this immersion into an unideal environment are numerous and deleterious. The lack of complete engagement in one's primary strengths stunts them, preventing growth. The overuse of the secondary strengths strains them, damaging them at a rate that outpaces any growth. Lack of potency in these areas carries over to peripheral functions of the mind and its subordinate members. Common knowledge of non-focused affairs and subjects is reduced, as mental capacity for fact processing and critical thinking suffers. Vitality and passion wane, as hobbies, those exercises in the refreshment of the mind, are given inferior attention. Socialization is a possible external source of vigor and aid. However, when socialization overlaps the pursuit of hobby, positive feedback loops, only positive in the mathematical sense, not a beneficial one, of negative perception in relation to desired outcome emerge. In aggregate, the effects of the unideal environment 
cause a net reduction in potency across all abilities of the mind. Of note is the emergent quality of self-absorption. Across the board reductions in function performance trigger an analytical routine that will attempt to seek remedy for the decay. This routine will run continuously in the background of the mind. All thought, emotion, and activity will be processed through this routine, which has but one goal, to fix or heal oneself. The exclusivity of objective brought about by the remedy routine in turn causes a reduction in function performance, specifically in the social category. When the mind is firstly considering all actions made and possible to make in relation to the betterment of itself, it is only secondarily considering, if even that highly, the concerns and statuses of all points of contact within the containing social network. In one sense, this would be efficacious for the whole, as remedying a single point in the network can only benefit all other points. However, when the remedy for said point remains elusive, resources that could and even ought be dedicated to the network remain isolated within the concerns of the One. Thus far, all points described have been valid in the argumentative sense. They each follow one from the other. Portions of the system that perform inadequately generate symptoms that logically follow from their natures. The system, nevertheless, is not limited to what can be considered logical or understandable errors. Strange phenomena also emerge during this condition. Whether they are descendants of the breakage is debatable, but given the widespread deficiencies in system function, it seems plausible. Particularly concerning are the emotional disruptions prompted by considering stimuli from the social network. Their natures do not follow from the events that elicit them, or their magnitudes are so out of proportion to the expected disruption as to suggest an undiagnosed defect in the system, extant diagnoses notwithstanding. The triumvirate of emotions that most seriously cause concern are shame, sadness, and anger. These arise primarily when the mind juxtaposes outcomes from social situations that were considered desirable with those outcomes that did manifest in fact. The emotions have been of sufficient strength to elicit unexpected and sometimes even uncontrollable vocalizations, typically either meaningless or uncontrollably misanthropic. The objects of these reactions vary from considered social antagonists to social allies, even of dedicated and binding relationships. The system as a whole has no reason to experience these surges of emotion. Whether vocal or mental, the undesired ideas persist. This prompts the question, are they truly undesired? The only answer that allows the retention of sanity apparent or factual, is that yes, these are anomalies brought about by an ailment and not truly reflective of the mind's nature. To accept otherwise would be to recognize that one is not what one staunchly maintained. It would mean the dissolution of identity. From such would follow the destabilization of the mind's parts, its values, methodology, and emotional machinery biological persistence would dictate the formation of new mental components. These would emerge from the turmoil caused by the destabilization and likely be composed of the conflicting and tumultuous reactions described as problematic earlier. Thus, the mind is constantly in tension with itself. When considering a conflict that has two participants, both of which are the same party, one realizes that, if pursued to resolution, such a conflict guarantees that the one party will experience a loss. The only winning move is not to play. Sadly, the bout has already begun. Is there, within the mind, an option for a draw?